Hey, what's going on, everyone? I'm so glad you're here. You're still listening and you're enjoying the content. If you are, can you please leave a comment on whatever medium you're listening to this on uh, or head over to my Instagram and leave me a comment there. I really want to hear from you guys what you're enjoying and who you might think that I might like to have a conversation with. I'd love to reach out to them and bring some of their content to our channel um, so that we can get you know great messages and great conversations out to people. Um, this conversation is really, really interesting. Aaron Bowman runs a Telegram group called East Coast PMA, and he runs a company where he sets up PMAs for others who effectively are trying to take control of their businesses in a way that they are impenetrable now with kind of overreach that we are seeing currently. If some of this doesn't really make any sense, it'll definitely it will shed more light in the conversation that we actually have as to what private members associations are, how they operate, why they're important, and how you could potentially set one up yourself or if anyone that you know. If anyone that you know, you feel like they could benefit from the conversation that we just had and you're about to hear, if you feel like anyone could benefit from this information, please share this to them. And then please either get in contact with me or Aaron himself. All this information is going to be in the description. And um, I, I truly do think a lot of people need to hear this, this information. So right before we get into the, the episode, um, I want to tell you about a couple quick things. There's a couple of links in the description here. One is for Food Forest Abundance. So Jim Gale was on the podcast a couple weeks ago now, and uh, he runs a company called Food Forest Abundance. And it's all about taking control of your sovereignty, your in your own backyard and becoming agrarian, becoming dependent on yourself for your own food production. Thus, all these crazy things that are happening in the world, you will be totally independent from that system. So even people like Adrian Grenier uh, reached out to him from Entourage and uh, saw the value that he was providing to people. And he um, got in contact with him and built one in his backyard. And they've got some promotional material with him it's really, really great. It's fantastic. I think it's awesome, awesome stuff. So if you're interested, the link's in the description there. Jurisdictionary is the gentleman I just had on a, uh, last week, I think, at least. And uh, Dr. Graves made an amazing course about understanding your rights and how to enforce them. I think this is extremely important. As I said at the, end, at the beginning of the other one was, uh, you know, some of the things that we're realizing is that uh, no one's coming to save you. And that's not a you know, new agey thing to say about, oh, working out and getting into the best mindset and all that kind of stuff. It's really also learning your rights. Because we're seeing people are really pushing them to their extreme and people can step on you if they want to, if you're not going to do anything about it. So learn how to do something about it with Dr. Graves' course in the description. And lastly, I just have the uh, basically a general description of some of the products that I take uh, to take control of my health, especially right now where it feels like uh, all they want us is fat, dumb, and stupid. So um, Bioptimizers is a company that I use for magnesium, for cognitive um, ability, all those different things uh, for doing sort of podcasts like this and something to do it for two hours and you can have sort of a sharp mind for. So um, those products are great. They're all natural. Wade Lightheart is a, you know, a bodybuilder. He made the company and he's he's unbelievable that what they're doing there with the, the work and all that kind of stuff. So it's very, very quality products and um, they're, they're great. So I just had it in the description there. If you want to check them out and see um, if anything works for you, that'd be awesome. So without any further ado, let's get in the episode. All right, everybody, welcome back. What's going on? Uh, we're back watching uh, Dig Within. I haven't done uh, one of these in a little bit, so the intro there is uh, kind of rusty. I've been taking some time <laughs> off since the uh, since the Christmas break, but I'm really excited today. Um, I have Aaron Bowman with me, and he is here to talk about private membership membership associations, uh, PMAs. I, I touched on this a little bit with my chat with Robert Michael and Mike Petrano, um, and he, Aaron himself, runs a information group on Telegram called East Coast PMA, and he runs his own PMA called Liberty House. Um, so yeah, without any further ado, I'd like to bring him in and uh, we can get started in the conversation. So Aaron, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on, Rob. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, these concepts. I think hopefully more and more people are realizing that this is kind of the way forward. And a lot of people might not know anything about this. So I really want to just start off potentially with maybe how you found out about them, why it was interesting to you, what's a PMA and why is it significant in today's world that we're in right now? Sure. So 
Yeah, it's kind of uh, the origin story, as it would be. It was very, uh, uh, very weird how it all came together. I think everything kind of happens for a reason. So let's go back to right the beginning of the pandemic or the pandemic, whatever you'd like to call it, as it started. Things here, I'm in uh, the States, so I'm in Connecticut, and uh, things started to come with, uh, you know, the five days to flatten the curve or the 15 days, whatever it was now, you know, put a mask on. And I was like, okay, I guess I can kind of see that maybe. Then it turned into, hey, you can't hug your parents, or if your parents come up from Florida, you can't talk to them. You know, they got a quarantine. And I was like, all right, something doesn't seem right here. So I think just deep down inside, you kind of get that burning in the in the pit of your stomach, knowing that, okay, something's not right. So that's when I started looking at other groups that were out there um, that were dealing with the medical tyranny that was going on. And I started getting a little bit more involved here as far as the different freedom groups or freedom cells, whatever you'd like to call them. And so we were actually meeting at my real estate office for uh, Pam Popper's uh, Make America's Free Again. And so I like the concept behind it, you know, helping small businesses, raising money to file lawsuits against these, you know, tyrants. And it really didn't seem to, I think too many people felt it was too much, too Trumpy, like make America great again type thing, which I get that, you know, and, um, but out of one of those meetings, I met uh, what are currently my two other trustees. And we had a third trustee who had to step down after uh, just life kind of got too busy for him and he just couldn't put in the time. So we were sitting here and uh, one of them was like, Hey, I've got this tap room that I'm not using. It's an industrial space. Let's do something with it. So we're like, great. We haven't been able to really congregate, get together, you know, do anything without having to worry about wearing masks or people looking at you like you have three heads because you just want to give somebody a hug or a high five or what have you. And uh, so we did a freedom bazaar. We threw it together in like two weeks and we had a bounce house. We had uh, a face painter that also did henna stuff and she hadn't done anything in almost a year or well close to it probably because, you know, winter time and she did a lot of the um, Renaissance fairs and festivals. Well, those all stopped because of it. So she was more than excited to drive an hour to come to our thing. And uh, so she was doing face painting, henna tattoos. We had some local businesses in there, local vendors, people, you know, we had some farmers in there and it was great. Everybody who was not wearing a mask, kids were running around with no shoes on. Everybody was like high-fiving and, you know, drinking some uh, homemade beer that, you know, one of our members had, had made. So after that, we were like, wow, this was awesome. Everybody had a good time. How can we do this again? Because there's obviously a need for it right now, but how do we do it while protecting ourselves? And that was the biggest thing. How do we do it where we can fight back the mandates using everything that's in place? And the biggest thing for me was, yeah, I know we have constitutional rights at the time that I really fully understand what those were. Probably not. Civics isn't taught anymore in school. I had no idea how the court systems work or what was a mandate versus a statue or any of those different things. So it kind of went down that rabbit hole. And uh, one of our uh, trustees, uh, I think it was, might've been Anna. And she was like, Hey, I was looking at PMAs. We should look into that. And I'm like, well, what the heck's a PMA? I never heard of that before. So then I start looking at that, ended up meeting, uh, David Edwards talked with him for over an hour on the phone. We had similar backgrounds, both in the military, both in law enforcement, both just kind of, you know, I mean, he's been doing it for 35 years. So when he was originally doing this, a lot of it was done by, you know, good old fashioned snail mail as opposed to today. So after we talked, I said, Hey, I want you to set up a, uh, a ministry for us here. We're going to be called the Liberty house ministries. And I want to know how to do this because they're not very big here in new England, but I know what a drinking club is down south. And I didn't even realize that was a PMA. So that's kind of how it all got started. And then there's a lot of training and a lot of reading. And, you know, people always ask me, well, where can I read more on these? Well, pick up your state constitution or your, you know, or the U.S. Constitution, pick up the Federalist Papers in court cases and start reading these because they are backed by court cases and, you know, stuff in the constitution, which once you kind of see how it all works, our founding fathers here anyways in the, in the U.S. really laid everything out for us and everything works perfectly. We just have corrupt people that have manipulated the system and then we have a bunch of dumb Americans that don't know the difference or what their constitutional rights are or anything like that. I mean, half the people probably, you probably, if you ask somebody who Sam Adams was, he, you know, a guy who makes beer, you know, that's, <laughs> that's kind of where we're at. So it was a big education part of my end, myself, and then really just reading a lot of different case laws to look at the different cases that back these, um, these PMAs. 
So that's kind of in a nutshell how we got started. Okay. And so, okay. So for, for people who don't know what then, what's the, what's the significance of a PMA? Like why would that be important for people to look at right now? So right now we're all facing lockdowns, mandates, forced vaccination, vaccine passports, all these different things to go into a restaurant, to go into a nightclub, to go grocery shopping, what have you. What's great about the private membership associations, and I use PMA as a catch-all, and there's a couple different types, so I'll touch on those real quick. You have your standard PMA, which is like your social club. Uh, down south, they're you know, drinking establishments, so there's still dry counties, and if you want to go into a restaurant and have a beer, well, then you have to join their drinking club. And so that's like your standard PMA. You also have a private health association, which is anything related to healthcare. And then you also have a private education association, which is all educational or uh, education enrichment. Out of those three, those can also be faith-based. So what we call FBOs. So it can be a, a faith in nature, a faith in God. And so you have all the same three. And then on top of all that, you can have an unincorporated church or ministry. And they're, the reason why these are important is, I mean, for me, if, if you start searching or if, or if you want, I can uh, send you a list of a lot of different PMAs that are out there, but there's a lot of farmers that are PMAs. So if I wanted camel's milk, not that I would, but there's some people that like it and uh, you can join a PMA of this farm and they can sidestep all the USDA regulations because of the way the contracts are written, we're allowed to have unlimited private contracts throughout um, you know, member to member. So if I had a farm that had goat milk and uh, camel milk and maybe free range beef, and you said, Hey, Aaron, I want to order, you know, two pounds of hamburger, two gallons of camel milk, because you and I are, you know, you're part of my PMA, you've signed my agreement, you then can have access to what I have for sale or service. And then we don't have to worry about, you know, the USDA, anything being inspected, anything like that. So what's great about these is, we, you know, they don't work for every business or every situation, but they work for majority of them. And it allows you to keep your business private and allows you to have unlimited contracts with your members so you can provide a service. So you don't have to worry about, hey, we can't have more than, you know, gather more than five people in one area. Well, if I have a private membership association, I can gather with as many members as I want and nobody can say anything about it. The only time any three-letter agency or the government can start sticking their nose in is if you're causing a clear and present danger or substantial evil. And the towns and the states and the government knows what PMAs are because some of the most recent court cases I've looked at, they, they state that in there. They're a clear and present danger to the kids not wearing a mask. Like, come on. They know exactly what they're trying to do. So, you know, it, it isn't, I don't want everybody to think like it's this, you know, huge shield that's going to protect you 100%. It will, but you need to know how to defend it, right? Just like if Darth Vader really knew how to defend a Death Star, he would have got rid of that little hole where they could have shot the missile down to blow it up, right? So you need to know how to defend it, how to verbalize it, how to handle different agencies if they come poking their nose around. And that's kind of something we talk about in the Telegram group. And, and I do, I try to do weekly um, live videos through the Telegram. And, you know, it's just understanding that, you know, your PMAs, are um you know here in the u.s they're they're backed by the first fifth ninth tenth and fourteenth amendment a lot of the amendments that talk about association um the you know a lot of the court cases that are standing talk about pmas as a shield as a refuge and then for you guys up in canada we actually pull from the canadian charter of rights and freedoms and like i was telling you earlier i haven't done any in canada yet so i really haven't read through that so i was just kind of freezing it over, I guess is the best way to put it. And you have, you know, the fundamental freedoms and right there, it says freedom of peaceful assemble. So freedom of association, that's C and D under fundament, uh, fund fundamentals of freedoms. Can't talk today, but just those alone would allow you to create something where, again, you're able to have your private business be private and then, you know, public business is public. So if somebody had, uh, let's say an LLC and they were a masseuse or, they were a chiropractor and they didn't want to take, you know, say, Hey, I have to see your vaccination card or you have to wear a mask when you come in here, or I have to take your temperature before you come in. They could literally, if they wanted to leave that LLC open and not really do much with it, but then have a second side of the house, which would be a private health association. 
and then they could provide that care to their members without having to worry about regulations, statutory, whatever they want to throw at us or whatever the, uh, the soup of the day is, you know, they can have people come in, not wear a mask. They can say, Hey, you need to have so many adjustments. This is what's going to treat this. And this is what's going to help with that. And they can have those, I like to say human conversations that you would have if you were sitting around your dining room table, you know, with your, with your friends and family, if you can talk about it around your dining room table and do business that way, you can do it in a PMA. Right. I think reading between the lines there, it's those, those uh, certain people who have found certain solutions to certain problems who end up having to either be taken out of the country or uh, commit suicide in a very interesting way. Yeah. Um, Clintonized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, so I think a huge distinction between people conceptualizing this maybe, and maybe they're unaware of what this, I've tried to highlight this in a couple other podcasts, but the distinction between the public and the private. And I would say the difference essentially is that public creatures have to abide by public codes, statutes, laws, and all those different things. Correct. Private private in institutions, or again, with this unincorporated associations, they are not asking for incorporation from the state or the province, whatever that be, are by them by their very nature, discriminatory and private. And right. I was wondering maybe if you want to touch on any of that. So the, the biggest thing is when you're, when you're having a PMA set up, you could, you can go to an attorney, they can set one up for you. There's a bunch of different places online that I've seen that people have, Hey, Hey, do you know anything about this, 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 this website where I've seen them as low as $250 to $10,000. I don't know what their documents look like. I only know what, what, what I work with. And if you go to an attorney or some of these other individuals, there's a good chance that they will be what we call statutory compliant which means there's some wording in there in all the documents at some point that says such and such PMA will follow all state rules and regulations, something along those lines. That's putting you right back in the public. If you're operating in the public domain, you have to follow the rules and regulations. So if they say you need to wear a mask to enter a store, okay, well, if I'm operating in the public and I'm going into a public store, that's required. That's what they're saying I have to do. Now, you can obviously walk in without a mask and 99.9% .9 of the time, nobody's going to say anything. But when you have a PMA that's non-statutory compliant, that leaves out that, that verbiage, you're allowed to operate again, any way your PMA sees fit based on your trustees, as long as you're not causing that clear and present danger of that substantial evil. So you could have, like I said, one business in the private where you take every you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry off the street that comes in that wants, let's say, a chiropractic adjustment. And when they start saying, oh, you're not essential business, you can't run anymore, you have to shut down, you know, let's so like, like a hairdresser for, you know, or a barbershop, you know, you're not essential, you have to close. Well, if I have a private membership association, that's a barbershop, that's offering that service to my members, well, I can stay open because it's a private contractual agreement between me and my members. You know, if I'm not a member, I just can't walk off the street and be like, hey, I want to get my hair cut. Well, we're a private membership association. You'd have to join our membership and then become a member to, to have that access. So it does in it does provide more protection in a greater range of things that you can do as opposed to operating in the public as an LLC, an S Corp, you know, a doing business as or a sole proprietorship where you're you're kind of forced to follow those those rules and regulations. Right. And I think that one of the things that I've heard you speak about on your channels and stuff like that, which I'll link to in the description for people uh, who want to learn more about, about what you guys do at Liberty House and with uh, East Coast PMA and whatnot. But effectively, I just want to maybe highlight this so that hopefully you can kind of maybe dive into this a bit more is this isn't something that's a catch all that's if you as soon as you do this, you're clear, you're, you're free and clear, they're never going to bother you ever again. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's something that you, you would have to we just released an episode with um, Dr. Grace from the jurisdictionary course, which is how to win in court without a lawyer. And I was wondering maybe if you can, in whatever way you want to kind of dive into it, that like, this isn't something that is going to be the be all and end all. You'll never get bothered. You're going to be pestered by some of these people and you're going to have to know how to defend that. Right. And they, and that is a great course. I've taken it myself. It's helped me out with a lot of things. And I think 
anybody that's watching this should definitely get that course at least. And I even recommend it to people when I set up their PMAs, like, Hey, you need to understand what a complaint is. You need to know how to answer it. If need be, you know, you need to understand if you have to go to court and you're getting a constitutional attorney that you understand what they're saying. So that course uh, I've talked to Dr. Graves a couple of times is a absolute fantastic, it is by far the best money I've ever spent probably on the internet. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, every, like, I'll go back and I'll read another section over again, or he'll add something to it. And I'm like, ah, oh, dang, I never, I never read that the first time I missed that, you know? So anyways, good course, but yes, with the PMAs, again, it's not just a, it's, yes, it shields you. Yes, it protects you, but it's going to be challenged. And it's in, of course, they're going to challenge it. And the way, what I mean by them is the, the government or the local government, they're going to challenge it because you're operating outside of their jurisdiction and you're able to operate and live as we were intended to freely and not have to worry about codes and regulations and everything like that. So they're going to try you. Um, I know a couple ladies that have private education associations and I was looking over some of their court documents and, you know, a cease and desist that was sent to them. And it wasn't even like a, an official court document. It looked like a monkey wrote it and it was, it, it was bad. But for example, she was operating as a, um, I'll make sure I get this right. So I think she was the one in, in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. She had been operating for years without a license and she was doing summer camps and the, and the town didn't have a problem with that. Why? Because she was letting the town come in, inspect everything, making sure everything was on the up and up, everything's good to go. And then when she decided to form uh, a PEA, a private education association, she said, okay, well, um, I'm not letting you in anymore. We're now a private membership association or a private education association. You have no standing here. It's private property. Um, please leave. And so they left and then they started staking out and like counting how many kids were coming in and when they were leaving. And that was one of the ones where they had a, a cease and desist. And basically it was, you know, there's a clear and present danger to the children because they're not wearing a mask. And I was like, well, how do they know they're not wearing a mask? They see him walk in without a mask on. Doesn't mean they don't put one on inside. Probably not, but they don't know. They're just speculating and they're trying to build a case by using the verbiage that they know they have to put in their in their pleadings to or in their complaint to be able to bring a case against them. And as far as I know, it still hasn't gone anywhere, you know, but they're going to put pressure on you. They're going to try to see how strong you are in your convictions and if you're going to stand behind your PMA. Now, I get the question asked a lot. What if I'm renting a spot? That's a little bit of a different story because the landlord or the building owner, they have certain rights that we can't infringe on. So, you know, like with us, we had a little run in with zoning and it was more of a, Hey, who are you guys? And why are you meeting at this one place? That's an industrial space. And you're doing like cool stuff there. We probably could have avoided all that if we just went and said, hey, we're Liberty House Ministries, we're a private membership association, and uh, you know we're going to be meeting kind of like an AA meeting, and we're going to be meeting with our members. It's completely private. I mean, they didn't really push us that, that much. We didn't stay there that long anyways, but at the end of the day, they didn't come after us because they knew they couldn't do anything. They were going towards the, the building owner from what we heard from the person that we were using the spot. So if you are renting, it helps if your landlord or whoever you're renting from is on board with what you're doing. And if not, then you're going to have to kind of, you know, fight those zoning things. And, you know, if you're zoned for meeting, you know, people at a, at a place to gather, then you shouldn't have a problem. You know, they might come in and say, oh, you have too many people meeting there. There's fire codes, this and that. And those battles, you're going to have to pick and choose what you want to fight, you know, to be quite honest. And, you know, if they're like, oh, you can't have more than 100 people in here. Okay, fine. We'll make sure from now on we don't have more than 100 people in here, right? I'm not going to fight that battle. It's not one that I, I feel needs to be fought. But if I'm meeting at, let's say we have, you know, our building that we're meeting in, and they say, you're not allowed to leave your house and, and congregate with people, you can't go more than, um, you know, a few miles, or I think, what is in Australia now, like 30 kilometers or something like that, you know, um, yeah, you can't tell me I can't do that when I'm meeting with my members. That's, that's not how that works. We're not, we're not causing any substantial evil. We're not causing any immediate harm or threat by gathering. So you have no standings here. And the way our documents are written, they're written that it says that if we go to court, yeah, they have no standing here, you know? So yeah, it's some people I think, you know, and that what's, that's what worries me sometimes is I'll have conversations. I'm like, well, who did your documents? Like, well, I bought them from this place online. I'm like, 
okay, did you talk to anybody? No, I just put in my information and hit like a buy now button. I was like, great. I have no idea what those documents say, you know? And it's just, I think if anybody's going to have a PMA done, they should definitely speak for at least, you know, 30 minutes to an hour with somebody like myself or one of the other advisors that David has or whoever's going to be setting up your PMA. So you really know what you're getting into and the different court cases, if you have to refer to them and stuff like that. So that's the, that's probably the biggest thing is, is understanding that it's not, you know, once you have this, you're never going to be challenged. Of course, you're going to be challenged. You're working within the system, but outside the system all at the same time, because you're using everything that was put in place by our founding fathers without having to, to bend to, you know, a knee to the, the current establishment. Yeah, it's some of those things that are coming coming across nowadays, especially in Canada, with the way that it's sometimes viewed to our neighbors down south about the Second Amendment and stuff like that. And the whole question obviously was, you know, a, a big argument for that was always, well, what if the government becomes tyrannical? And it's that'll never happen. And like, well, <laughs> welcome to 20, 2020 to 2022. Yeah. And I think that like, I've heard you speak about it before too, where, you know, it's something that these intelligent men that set up the system that, you know, we're currently operating in knew that these things could happen and thus wrote these kind of things in a certain way where you can take advantage of these sorts of solutions in the face of the problems that we're, we're seeing in today's world. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, especially here in the States don't have a real good grasp on the constitution, the bill of rights, the Federalist Papers, uh, the Anti-Federalist Papers, any of that stuff, even basic laws or case law that goes back uh, to the, the founding fathers. And I think a lot of people think that the federal government created the states, which then created the rights for the people, which isn't really how it works. You know, uh, people came over from England, they founded the colonies, the colonies, you know, created the states, that was the people created the states, the states then created the federal government to protect our inalienable rights that were given to us by, you know, God or a higher being, however you want to look at it. And what has happened over the years is we've taken a lot of God out of out of school, we've taken civics out of school, you know, you know, now it's like US history, they don't teach you the ins and outs of the Constitution, or what the 14th Amendment says versus the Second Amendment. And, you know, the Second Amendment's not there just for hunting. That, that's, that's not it at all. It's there to be able to protect ourselves. And I guarantee that if people in Australia hadn't a Second Amendment right now, they wouldn't be in the world of hurt that they're in right now. And I think the more people start waking up, I guess is the best way to put it, or seeing the light that yes, there's something seriously wrong here, whether you know, you want to get vaccinated or not, that's your own business. I could care one way or another, you know, me personally, not happening. But when you start seeing that, okay, now I had to get one shot. Now it's two shots to be fully vaccinated. Now it's two shots and a booster before I can go to the grocery store, but yet I can still get it, still transmit it and still die from it. Well, then what was the point of getting it in the first place? Right. And I think more people are starting to understand that and starting to understand like, Hey, I have rights here. I may not know exactly what rights being violated, but it is. And if you look in Alfonso's group or uh, Dr. Graves group on Telegram, you know, there's more people now, once their livelihood is being threatened, their job, like, hey, it's either get a jab or get fired. They're like, well, no, that that's not how it works. That doesn't seem right to me. And now they're looking for answers. And I think you're going to start seeing, I don't want to use the word a revolution, but a real big awakening of people knowing that, hey, this isn't how things were meant to be. And the system works, but we've got these too many corrupted people in position that need to go. And you're going to start seeing lawsuits and lawsuits and people just standing up. And listen, the average person doesn't want confrontation. So as soon as you stand up to somebody, they're most likely going to back down anyways. You know, and I think slapping people with lawsuits and starting the groundwork with affidavits and, and laying out the facts, that's going to have a big, a big turn on how things have been going, you know, and um, I think PMAs has their part in there and they fall into that. And that allows, you know, like, Hey, listen, you're, you're a nurse. Two years ago, you were a hero for going to work. Now you can't go to work because you don't want to get vaccinated because it's your own personal choice not to be vaccinated, whatever that choice or reason is, it's your personal choice and nobody should be able to force anything on you. So now what are you going to do for employment? Now, now you can't work, right? If they don't take a, a religious exemption or something along those lines, well, you set yourself up 
a private health association. You start bringing in members. You start treating people as an RN or an LPN or a chiropractor or a natural homopathic healer. You start charging them. You don't need insurance. You know, you can, you can do it ways. Like there's a video I did with uh, Dr. Lane, who's also an advisor, and she's a chiropractor. And I asked her, I said, I get asked, how does insurance work? She does something called super billing or itemized billing, where she has the patient pay up front. She gives them a list, and then that person submits it to their attorney or attorney, their uh, insurance agency, and then they normally get reimbursed for certain things. So there are ways of doing it. We just need to start thinking outside of that little box that they've put us in. And, you know, if you've lost your job and you were uh, somewhere in the health field, then go start a private edu- a private health association or even a ministry and then have some education aspect to it while providing, you know, medicine to people. You can do all those things and not have to worry about the mandates coming down or what the government's saying. Yeah, and I truly believe that and I was watching, just trying to get inspiration because we're kind of getting hit on all sides here, but so we're watching 300 and, you know, I think a huge part of that movie is more, there's something that I think the, 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 the queen says that at the beginning is not, not what you should do, not what a king should do, but what would a free man do? And that's a huge portion of what these, that yeah. whole, the ethos of that entire, um, I would say the entire kind of Greek thought would be, but you know, the, the, I think what it is now is finding personal tribes, personal, like your own personal Sparta to a certain degree, which I think is these private groups that are saying, Hey, we are, you know, we're done with playing all these different games that have been happening with cancel culture for the past X amount of years, right? Like we're discriminatory. We're not messing around anymore. We're going to operate this way. And we choose to operate this way. And, you know, I just wanted to hit on that, that idea that you have to buttress yourself with the knowledge because they will come knocking, but you have, well, yeah, the tools are there to enforce your rights, but they're only your rights. If you enforce them, people can't like someone can assault you in the middle of the street, right? People can do that and they can get away with that. If you don't do anything, it, it's you, you have to be the initiating factor to, um, you know, enforce your rights to be withheld. Right. Yeah. And that's a good point. You know, um, if uh, I don't know if you've checked out uh, Chris Ann Hall, she has Liberty First University. Um, Not a lot of stuff, obviously, for the Canadians, but the U.S. listeners, it's she dives really good into the founding documents. And I'm probably going to butcher this, but if, if I remember the way she puts it, you know, liberty is freedom and morality. You know, like we're all free. We're free to commit murder. We're free to do whatever we want but that's not liberty, right? Liberty is having that freedom plus the morality. And I think when people start understanding that, start really thinking, okay, you know, there's something wrong here. It doesn't take long to learn this stuff. It doesn't take long to read the constitution, to read the Federalist papers, you know, to listen to, you know, different podcasts where people are talking about it to really understand what your, your, your rights are and then how to protect them. And once you realize it and, and take that, that veil of mystery off how the court systems work and everything like that. You're like, Oh, this is it. This is easy. You know, like, Oh man, you know, like a law has to be written. So like, how do they put it? Like a law has to be written. So like a third grader can understand it. Right. Common, common verbiage, not anything where you have to pull out six different dictionaries to figure out what somebody's talking about. So once you start diving into this stuff, you start realizing how easy it is. And I think that's the reason why they don't teach this stuff anymore is because they don't want people to understand. They want people to be home sitting, watching Netflix, ordering stuff on Grubhub or DoorDash or whatever, and not worry about everything and just keep getting their stimulus checks coming in and everything like that. And, you know, Hey, we're good. We can do whatever we want to these people now, but I think more people are starting to wake up. And, you know, I know here in Connecticut, uh, we are seeing a, a, a growth in different groups that meet, weekly, monthly, you know, every other week, whether it's just a potluck and everybody gets together and just, you know, either pitches about what's going on and what they can do to, to change it versus, you know, homeschooling has become huge and, and stuff like that. And homeschoolers getting together and, and really you start building that network. Cause for a while I was like, man, there is something wrong. Like, am I crazy here thinking there's something wrong going on? You know, you listen to a few different podcasts and it's all doom and gloom. And you're like, there's definitely something weird here. And then you can only talk to certain people about it. Cause if you say anything against it, you're like, Oh, you're, you're an anti-vaxxer. You need a tinfoil hat. And I'm like, no, I'm just asking questions. Like 
Everybody should ask questions. I always teach my kids, question everything. Don't take anything for face value. Just like when I was learning the PMAs, I'm like, okay, great. Where are the court cases I can go read on this? Where can I learn more information? And that's when David was like, well, start with the constitution. Start with your state constitution. Here's some court cases to look at. You know, anybody can jump into a Google Scholar and type in private membership associations and see the countless cases that have come up where they've stood the test of time. You know, everything from the NAACP to, uh, uh, what's the one I have here? Um, Bird versus Arizona, where it's the First Amendment right to associate creates a preserve or a shield to, to um, the freedom of assembly. So getting to know, okay, so, you know, what amendments do I need to look at? Really diving into those and understanding it. Then that, like that light bulb goes on. You're like, hey, this isn't as hard as I thought it was. And then there's like this breath of fresh air. You're like, I can do this. I can meet with people. I can have a business. I can do all kinds of things where I don't have to worry about somebody telling me I can't because I didn't want to follow the rules or their mandates to get a vaccination. You know what? If I don't ever go to a bar again, I'm all right with that. I have no problem drinking a beer at my house with my wife and my five kids. Like I'm good with that, you know, or my friends coming over or Liberty house gets together for an event and we're all, you know, fellowshipping together. I don't need to go to the bar. You know, I don't, you know, as much as I like going out into a restaurant, you know what? There's going to be restaurants that are PMAs and I'll have no problem going to support them. You know, it's just, I think it's, I think you're going to start seeing more of them and more of them. And, you know, it's kind of like that thing where you're like, I was looking to buy a truck. So I was looking to get a, uh, uh, rid of my Chevy and get a Tacoma. And as soon as you start looking, it's like, you know, when you look at something online, then it pops up everywhere because of the cookies and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's another Tacoma. There's another Tacoma. You know, once I got into the PMAs and started looking to see what PMAs were out there, it's like, man, they're like, I hopefully will get to the point where I never have to actually leave my house to go to the grocery store if I don't want to, because there's enough PMA set up where I can order soap, food, vegetables, beef, jerky, whatever I need. There's enough, I think, that are going to be set up through a network of PMAs where you'll, we'll all be self-sufficient, which will be great. Uh, yeah. And I think it's, it's a concept. This is what, one of the questions I had for you was, you know, I think for people who are new to this information, maybe the best way to conceptualize it is that it's shifting your mentality to b businesses that you frequent as a, and, and changing that into like, you are a member of that society, not a customer to a corporation. You're a part of that community, which I think a will bind you to a social cohesion, which we need at this time, because everything is just these massive corporations and stuff like that, where this is, you know, you know, I saw the writing on the wall as soon as this happened. And I was like, the first thing I need to do now is find the closest farmers that I can to me, get a part of some CSAs or something like that, where yep. you're buying directly from them. And that's a fact. I mean, I, I don't know in Connecticut, but all of Canada, you know, raw milk is totally uh, outlawed. And really the whole, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. The whole country. It's, I think it's the same as uh, heroin or something like that. Like they, the RCMP would like raid your bar, raid your that's entire farm. Crazy. Yeah. Well, let me know if you need me to smuggle some up. I haven't been to Canada in a while, but <laughs> yeah, well, well actually, yeah. And I, but, but again, I found uh, a PMA that's that, that does that here. Right. And it's a, it's a small one. I don't know how kind of um, strong it would be if you, if you kind of tried to help hold that up or whatever, but again, it's that it's the same concept of you're a part of a society or a part of a membership and you are a contributing factor to that because you're supporting something like that. And I was wondering, like you've mentioned before about, how some businesses can prosper from this, some it's a bit more difficult. How do you, is there a way that you can effectively structure that in your mind of like, what, what, would, what would work, what wouldn't work? Why, why is there a kind of like a difference between the two? What businesses would prosper in this regard? How is it kind of difficult for other ones? Yeah, so I think majority of businesses or if you wanted to start a community would, would benefit. Now, like, I also do real estate. I'm a licensed real estate agent here in Connecticut and I have to have my license to transact real estate. I have to have a license to get access to the MLS, which is where all the houses are listed and posted. Now, could I, in theory, create a PMA that's just for selling and transacting houses? Absolutely. Do I have the resources to create my own MLS? No. Do I think I can bring in enough people to transact buying and selling houses to where it would be where I could make an income off it. Probably not. Most people sell one to two houses in their entire lifetime. So 
that for me, in theory, could it be done? Sure. Do I think it's worth its time and energy? Absolutely not. Same thing with, you know, if you were, let's say, a plumber and you have to have a license to get settling or certain compounds to be able to do plumbing. Would it make sense for you to, to lose that license and become a PMA? Because then how would you get the things that you need? So there are certain times where it's not going to work. But if you're anybody really in the health field, if you're an educator, if, you know, like with Liberty House, we started off, you know, we've kind of changed and grown a little bit um, since we started, you know, and now we're, you know, more of a community that has, you know, we have an ordained minister, we have, um, you know, we teach different classes. So like, you know, I relied on some of my military background and we did like a preparedness class. That was a couple hours. And at the end of the day, we made a, a wash machine out of a five gallon bucket with a lid and a standard plum, um, plunger, right? So like learning different skills and as your community builds, you know, especially like for us, or if you're doing a community-based type PMA, where you have some type of outreach to the community, you know, like what we're doing, you start to grow, you start to have families come in, you start to have other people that bring in different skill sets. So now if I need some carpentry done on my house, I'm not going to call Joe Carpenter on the street. I'm going to put it out into Liberty House first to see who has those skills. And we're working on putting a thing together for different skill sets and that sort of thing, because I'd rather spend a dollar in my community than a dollar to outside the community, you know, and you start building this stuff. And then this person knows somebody else. And maybe there's another PMA that you start doing business with and things just kind of organically grow to where now I don't have to go shopping for things. I know who can help me do my breaks or who does lawn care? Or if I need a babysitter that's not been jabbed and doesn't want to wear a mask in the house, I know that I can reach out to my members or maybe a members of another PMA in the area. Um, you know, we're even doing stuff now where we're putting together uh, time banking, which is a completely new concept to me. I know, I guess it's been around, but let's say I'm a mechanic, you're an attorney, Rob, and I say, hey, I'm going to do your breaks, takes me an hour you would then provide me an hour of attorney services. And I'm like, that's a great way to, to barter back and forth because eventually I think, you know, the, the inflation's going up right now. The, the federal reserve is raising the interest rates for, you know, buying houses. It's only a matter of time. I think I saw today that's the, it, it's 40% higher than the inflation's ever been or something like that. So, you know, we need to start looking at alternative currencies and other things that we can use within our groups. And, you know, uh, Crypto, I don't know, maybe it'll stay around, maybe it won't. But, you know, right now we're dealing with with silver within our groups. You know, it's something we're rolling out. And, you know, it's, uh, and, and that's working with another PMA, which is great, you know. So it, you just start kind of building stuff and it just kind of changes, you know. But um, I totally forgot where we were going with this question, but you <laughs> kind of got on a tangent there, but yeah, yeah no, that's, that's great. No. And, and I think it, it's, it's a lot of, it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of if, if you're a PMA, you can contract with other PMAs. And again, you're, you're totally operating the private there too. And I was wondering if you can maybe touch, cause you were just, you were saying essentially like, say you're a plumber or a carpenter, some sort of things, I've looked into this on the Canadian side, just for people who are in Canada uh, listening, you know, you guys, maybe we can dive into this too, but like you have to basically uh, grab an EIN so that if you potentially need to do certain things, um, you have that kind of availability. We're still trying to figure out in Canada kind of what the equivalent is and then how do you effectively get that without registering with the CRA and all that kind of stuff. But uh, with that, like the idea maybe to conceptualize if say you're a plumber or something like that, and you were, you were speaking before about, how you could effectively have an LLC, not use it all that much and have a PMA on the other side of that so that you can kind of operate in certain ways. And I'm wondering for people who are in different lines of, of business as it were right now, is it effective to use that kind of concept as opposed to totally shutting down, operating totally as a PMA because it might hurt your barrier to you know supplies or something like that? Right, so with the EIN, um... You can get an EIN here anyways, like we have one for Liberty House. Um, that is a, so if you go the EIN route for a faith-based, and faith is very loosely defined, under the IRS code, you can be tax exempt. There's under the 501c3, there's a 501, uh, 508c1a. Uh, I can never remember it sometimes. 508c1a, which is under the 501c3, which is what your standard churches are. Most of your churches, your nonprofits, stuff like that. 
But when you register or not register, but when you apply for an EIN for banking purposes only, and you put that you're a church, an unincorporated ministry, uh, faith-based organization, when you fill out your SS4, either by hand or now you can even do them online for faith-based organizations, they'll give you an EIN for banking purposes only. And filling it out correctly allows you to invoke that part of the IRS code, which makes you tax exempt. So Liberty House is tax exempt. So any donations that we have coming in or money's coming in, we don't have to pay taxes on that because we're a faith-based organization. And the way it's written is if you're a church, synagogue, mosque, outpost, outbuilding, and there's a couple other things in there um, as far as being a faith-based organization, you're automatically tax exempt. And again, it's one of those things that's buried in the tax code. Unless you were to look for it, you wouldn't know it was there. And I don't, I think that's the reason why a lot of churches aren't that, you know, um, there was a guy, uh, I cannot remember his name now in Canada. I was actually following one of the pastors up there. He got arrested a couple of times with his brother and yeah. uh, Paul, I want to say Paul, but that's not it. Anyways, it's a Polish you know, name or something like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 So having, you know, if, if the churches were set up as a 508 C1A, they wouldn't have to shut down during the lockdowns. You know, it's that whole separation of church and state, but because they fill out all this paperwork to be a nonprofit organization, they have to follow those rules when the government puts them out. So um, that's the EIN and you can get those for, for the, for the PMAs fairly easily. Now, um, what was the second part of your question? Um, like, I guess to, to conceptualize it, what I'm trying to say is like, what, wh how would oh. like a restaurant or how would, a, how would a gym owner, like if they need gotcha. to order equipment or something like that, like, is yep. it advantageous to say the LLC and like have a PMA on the side or dissolve one or the other? So I wouldn't have anybody dissolve an LLC until they were fully up and running as a PMA. And that's really the route they wanted to go. Cause in some cases you might want to keep, um, you know, the LLC side open because, Maybe there's no mandates right now. Things are kind of relaxed. We can operate businesses that way. When things start to get tough again, then you can have those current clients or customers come over to the PMA. Now, you have to be very, it's a fine line. You have to really make sure you're separating the two. So there's been a, a, a couple court cases, but one that I saw where the guy had an LLC and a PMA of exactly the same name. His mistake was he was taking money into the LLC that was, I guess, as his, as he put it in the court documents, supposed to be for the PMA. So he was trying to invoke the PMA, the PMA protection, which he couldn't because everything was coming in through the LLC. So if you have an LLC open, you have to have a separate account, separate books for that. This is what I tell people. And then any money that comes into that LLC goes through there. Now, if you have members that are part of your PMA, and you're operating that side of the house. Also, any transactions or anything that happens within the PMA has to be done in um, a separate set of books. So, you know, once you get that EIN, you can also do wholesale purchases, stuff like that. So you may not need to keep the, the LLC open once you have your EIN and the PMA properly structured and up and running and you have members and you have your trustees and maybe you throw in an advisory board or what have you. But you know, there, and this is why it's important to talk to somebody about it before you run out and set up a PMA or buy one online without talking to somebody, because one, you don't know what those documents are going to have in them. And two, they're tailored to you and your specific situation. So for example, I've been talking with uh, some people out of Arkansas that want to have a butchery and they were looking at doing it one way with the USDA. And they basically have to sell like half the cows or, or that sort of thing. But once they realize the, the advantages of operating a PMA, they now realize that they can sell ground beef, they can process everything themselves, sell it to their members, they can go out to uh, the member's property if they, let's say they shot a deer and they needed it, you know, a butcher to come out and process it for them, they can do that without having to worry about all of the red tape of the USDA. So they decided, you know, we're not even going to open up an LLC side. We're starting from the ground up. We're going to start everything as a private membership association. So there is, it really, it's, it's, it really depends on the person's situation, whether you should keep the LLC open or not. Now, you know, I'm, I've been uh, working with one of the local gym owners here and we've been going back and forth. I had to change his documents because originally um, I thought it was just going to be like, you know, a typical CrossFit gym. You 
pick up some weights, you put them down, you do your wads of the day and you move on. And I get there, he's got grass fed beef. He's got massage therapists. He's got a room where he sits and he talks about mental strength and changing your body from the inside. I'm like, dude, you have a faith-based organization here. You know, we have faith in nature. This isn't just a regular PMA. So now I got to go back to the drawing board and redo things. But that's why it's important that you have these conversations with somebody that has been setting these up, knows how to do them, or at least can point you in the right direction. Right. Okay. Um, one of the things that I was curious about too, because I know that like, let's say you're running a, a, a restaurant or, or even certain things, like if you're buying bulk of t-shirts or something like that, right? Sometimes businesses that they contract with you, they need certain things on their end, like business numbers or something like that to, to kind of transact that way. Would that be something that you need to kind of have where either you find the right people who aren't asking for those things? Like I'm wondering those kind of like intricate things about each business you, i'm just trying to find the distinction between like what would work as a pma and what wouldn't and like how does someone conceptualize if theirs would, if their business would work and what would be you know the ins and outs of those kind of things even things like loans like would you, you were talking about renting spaces and stuff like that too and it's sort of like do you have to kind of have a perfect situation what if you do need a business well, not a whole lot of places that can like just start something up with a bunch of uh, backing right. and money and stuff you know what i mean so there, there are certain places you can go to for loans. So like Liberty Dollar Financial uh, Association, who we use, it's all backed by silver. They actually have a peer-to-peer -peer loan program. So you can get uh, loans through there. I don't want to use the word trust too much because people start getting confused, but you could think of like, if you're buying a piece of property or getting a loan or something like that, you could always go the private loan route through maybe a private money lender or, you know, maybe a local credit union where you could go and it would be the trustees of the said PMA that would be applying for the loan, right? So um, the way that the PMAs are set up is that they're also set up where they can do business with other business entities and uh, doing business as. So if there's a local bank you want to work with for your banking purposes, you can do that within the PMA. Um, doesn't mean they become a part of the PMA or anything like that. It just allows you to have that private contractual agreement between them. So there are ways to, to get that stuff done. Now for us, we are actually uh, in the process of setting up like a, a food drop. So there's a, there's a couple different PMAs that deliver food in bulk and stuff like that. But um, some require an EIN number, some don't. And then, you know, it really depends on that, that company. So like one Azure's farm is one that that has a drop here in the state and they start on the West coast and they come all the way across. It's all organic and everything like that. You put your orders in once a month so we can buy wholesale from them, but they wanted to know, you know, where are we going to be doing our wholesaling from? You know, we had to answer some certain questions like, do you have a brick and mortar? How's it going to work? You know, do you have an EIN number, stuff like that? So we were able to provide that stuff. And that's something that we're eventually going to be getting set up. You know um, if it was something like t-shirts, like you have a t-shirt business, you know, you could definitely do a PMA for it. You know, it would be like, uh, you know, maybe a, a small boutique where you had a little storefront and anybody that came in became a member by buying a piece of clothing, right? Um, I just did one for a yoga studio up by Boston Mass and his whole agreement's right online. He also has the space set up where musicians can come in when he's not doing yoga and perform for people. So, uh, he has it set up where he has his waiver form and his membership form for the PMA. So when you log in to buy tickets to an event or to sign up for a session of yoga, you're agreeing to become a part of that PMA and your payment to become a part of that PMA is paying for those classes. So there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Again, I just think there's sometimes like you could do a restaurant as a PMA, you know, but you're only serving to your members. So maybe you keep the LLC side open so you can serve, you know, anybody off the street, but then when lockdowns start to happen and restaurants can't be open, you could still run and provide a meal to your members. So if you were doing it, you know, smartly, anybody that came in off the street as a regular customer on the LLC side, you would definitely let them know about the PMA side where, Hey, we're also a private membership association. If you want to come here during the lockdowns, if they happen to get a meal, we'll still be able to stay open. But the only way we can get you in here is if you're a member, you know, that sort of thing. So again, it's a lot of, it's very uh, detailed based on each person's situation, but there's only a handful of times where like, you know, being a realtor, maybe being a plumber where it's not going to, 
you know, work for you because you're just not going to have, you know, enough transactions to, you know, provide for yourself. And I think a lot of these PMAs start growing and be turning, like you said earlier, they turn into community. So if you're a farmer, that's a PMA and you have free range chickens, ducks, cattle, you know, all that stuff. And your members start coming there then they're going to be like, well, hey, can you teach us how to grow vegetables? Well, now you're doing a class. So now that's part of your education, part of your PMA. So, you know, sometimes I have to really kind of think about it because I know how we operate and we're kind of more of a community based. And somebody that's like, like the yoga guy, who was like, I teach yoga and I do this. I said, okay, well, what if somebody wants to learn how to teach yoga? Like, could you give like basic courses on you know, basic poses to learn how to do yoga. So there's always, we always leave that educational aspect in there too, because things will just naturally organically change as, as you go along, you know, same thing for like a natural homopathic healer that has a PHA, you know, their, their main thing is providing tinctures and, and helping people stay healthy naturally, but maybe they want to have a seminar one Saturday and they want to say, like we just did one with uh, Liberty house where members got together and made a tincture for the winter months to help your immune system, right? That's just something that person could do on their own with a PHA. They were a member, you know, they're a member of Liberty House. So we were able to put that together. We have a committee that does events. So we had the Liberty House events committee, put it together and find a location for it and stuff like that. So there's a lot that can go on, or you can keep it very simple and say, hey, I'm just going to adjust you as a chiropractor and you remember, and you come every Tuesday of the month and I adjust your back. You could do it that way too. You know, again, it's really open to, to each individual person. Yeah. And I think there's the way that I've been trying to conceptualize it too, is there's innovative ways to do it. Say you're a, a restaurant and you know, you're nervous about, well, if we're only doing members then what about walk-ins and all that kind of stuff, could you not have something on the front door or even on the menu of like a QR code and be like, Hey, yeah, all you have to do is just scan this thing. Yep. Basically, you know, it's, think about like in terms of service or in terms of an agreement, whatever, but it's actually your, your PMA agreement. And, you know, most people don't care about that. They're like, Oh, cool. That sounds awesome. Nobody like, reads that stuff. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> and, know? and that, that, that sense of community too, right. Where you're like, Oh, actually. And I was thinking about this too. Like, let's say they shut down or, you know, even things go back to normal. If everything's a PMA after that, maybe we can dive into this one next with, with the idea of licensing and stuff like that with like liquor and whatnot, if you're not having to pay for those different licenses or worrying about if, if this, that, or the other thing is up to code and whatever, if you can just operate the way that you want to operate, what if you're selling drafts of, of any sort of pint at a buck cheaper than anywhere else in town, because you're discriminatory for your members, but right. anyone can become a member, right? Yep. And that, and that's exactly how it works. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, you're right on point. You know, um, we'll do events like we had our Christmas bazaar and we had people show up that weren't members. So they come in, we, you know, how did you hear about us? You know, here's our membership agreement. Would you like an annual one? Are you here just for the day? Most of the time they're just there for the day. So we just write daily across that. You could have an RQ code that goes to a website where they check a box, hit submit, you know, something like that. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. And I've known of, um, some PMAs that were set up that were storefronts, you know, and, you know, to come in like a co-op to buy stuff, you have to become a member first. And, you know, there's no charge really for the membership agreement that's covered in the cost of your purchasing your items. So you could do the same thing with a restaurant or anything like that. Or, you know, I've been talking with a guy out on the West coast who is in a intentional living community and there's about three or 400 people there. And he's got um, a good sized vehicle. So he was looking to do like, almost like a, uh, a door dash the winter months, you know, go out of town, get the supplies that people need, bring them back. Cause he's able to do that and then sell it to their members. And I'm like, yeah, you could do that until you get the storefront open or, or what have you. But it's again, as long as you're just contracting with your members, you're going to be good to go. But you know, I love the idea of a QR code where somebody just scans it. Here's your membership agreement. Okay. What are the important parts? Highlight those and then check the box and, and, and keep going. Cause I mean, you do want people to read the membership agreement if they're going to become member members, you know, where they're active in the community or, you know, they're coming on a regular basis. And, you know, there are important things that they should know, like if, if there's going to be any types of lawsuits filed or anything like that, because maybe they came in and they drank a bad batch of kombucha and they got a tummy ache and now they want to sue you for it. Well, they can't based on the membership agreement. They have to take that up within the members ship, you know, within the PMA itself. And if they try to go to court, it states right in there that it's a private membership agreement and there's no standing for any outside jurisdiction. You know, again, they'll probably try to challenge that and stuff like that, but you know, 
when that time comes, you fight that battle. Yeah. And I, I was mentioning to you, I think the first time we chatted was uh, when I was doing my research in this with the Canadian side of things, I, I found one that was, I believe at the beginning of 2020 and one member was upset about something that happened. He was effectively kicked out or something like that of this, uh, of this PMA. And to make a long story short, just to hit on the importance of, of what we're talking about here is the court effectively was ruling on the Supreme Court of Canada. And what they effectively said was, all we have the power to do is look at your contract and see who's in violation of the contract itself. However, we have no authority over what happens in the con, what in, in, inside of the group, all those kind of things, right? They're just right. saying, we're just looking at the contract and the members of that who's in violation, whatever. And the unincorporated association, the PMA of which that was, was the Conservative Party of Canada. So, wow. yeah. And, and these are the kind of things that I, one of the things I wanted to ask you at the, at the hop there was um, examples of PMAs that would surprise people. And these are the things that would surprise people, right? Like the Conservative Party of Canada, the Bar Association, you mentioned the NAACP. You know what I mean? yep. Yeah. 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 And those are all the ones that people are like, wow, I never, I never knew that. And the NAACP, if anybody jumps into Google Scholars and types in uh, private membership associations, they'll come up and they've, I mean, I haven't, read every single case they have, but the ones I have read, they've, they haven't lost, you know, and uh, it's because they're operating properly. Now, if you have a PMA and you're running amok and you're doing everything wrong, well, then that's on you, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have a, not too many legs to stand on, but you know, one of the cases they wanted a, the list of the members and they were like, no, we're not giving the state a list of members. Why would we do that? And it went all the way into the courts and they said the state has no standing to ask them for their membership list. There are private membership association, just like the bar association or anything like that. So yeah, it is, it is kind of crazy that there are certain PMAs out there that you would never think about it until you start really diving in and looking into it. So what, what would things like licenses, like, is that something that you're, you're going to have to just like say a restaurant for an example. And because one of the huge things about, I don't know if it's the same in Connecticut there, but like in Canada was, uh, they were threatening some people who were saying, you know what, I'm, I'll fight you. I'll take the fines, whatever, whatever. Um, we're not going to do this. But then as soon as they went after the liquor license, that's when they were like, damn, I can't, you know, I can't like, I have to kind of like bow down because of these sort of things. So is that something that's like, if you take Dr. Graves' course, if you understand, you know, people from the Alphonse groups and stuff like that, is that effectively your best bet to um, conceptualize how you could effectively operate something like a restaurant or a bar or social club without a license for liquor, but you're you know, you're going to have to know how to enforce that because they're going to come after you kind of thing. Like what's your kind of interpretation on that? Yeah. I mean, again, with the PMAs, you don't need a license. You don't need any of that stuff that you would need. Like if you were a, a you know, a doctor, I mean, there's even been PMAs set up that were all full of pro se litigants that they helped other pro se litigants, you know, work their court cases. Not one person was a bar member or went to, you know, maybe they went to uh, law school, but never sat for the bar or anything like that. But they had a PMA set up to help other others with their, their court issues. So yeah, you could just like down in, in Texas and other dry in other spots that are dry counties, you can have that drinking establishment. So you could have your restaurant and then you could have liquor. So if you have a restaurant or bar and you are straight up PMA, they can't come in and tell you, you can't do that. I mean, they're going to try to, they're going to try to, you know, to, to put the squeeze on you. But if you know where you stand and how the law works and the court cases that are out there, then let them try all they want. You know, there's, there's standing court cases that show time and time again, how these PMAs have been successful. And that's why, you know, I think it's important for people to, you know, to get as many of these set up as we can, because if you are that person that has a restaurant and you have a bar there and, you know, you don't want to get shut down and you don't want to deal with the fines or what have you, then close down, reopen as a PMA, and then only let your members in, you know, now if like here in Connecticut, you know, we have package stores, that might be a little bit different. If you just completely sell straight, you know, beer and liquor, well, you want to be open to the public to get as many people in. Could you do it as a PMA? Sure. But would it be a lot more work? Probably, you know, um, but as like a restaurant or like a bar or something like that, you could have, I mean, I kind of tell people, you know, look at like your VFWs, your veterans um, buildings or your American legions, stuff like that. They're private, private clubs, so to speak. They're still a nonprofit. So they fall under the, the statues and whatnot. But if they were, you know, a straight up PMA as just, Hey, we're only letting veterans in, right. They could do that just like they do now. 
or family members of veterans or what have you, but they wouldn't have to worry about liquor licenses or stuff like that because they're allowed to operate in the private. Now, if they're selling booze to minors and kids are walking out of there at two o'clock in the afternoon that are 15 years old, that are three sheets to the wind. Well, that to me, you're, you're causing, you know, maybe not a substantial evil, but you're not doing something that's right. So then maybe somebody would have, you know, a leg to stand on to come in and shut you down for, for operating that way or selling to minors or something like that. Just like any other establishment, you know, it's a lot of like, if people talk common law all the time, you know, common law is very simple. There has to be an injured party. There has to be, you know, all these different aspects to it. You know, um, you know, if I didn't injure anybody, if I didn't cause harm to anybody, then, well, what are you coming after me for? You know? So, um, I think the more people understand that and just, you know, do what's right. You, you don't have to worry about it as much. So if you had a restaurant that wanted to sell booze, you could do that without the license and stuff like that. Now, there might be some challenges, you know, getting the booze or the alcohol because now you don't have the quote unquote liquor license. But again, you know, there, there are going to be a ways to get around all that stuff anyways. Yeah. Cause I feel like they could probably pressure and say, well, how was it purchased? And if it was purchased by a trustee or one of the founding members, then would they go after them for whatever? But then again, would that not be the idea that like, cause I guess that maybe I can lean into this question with that is, what do you have to do and change in maybe your conceptualization and in terms of how you're operating the PMA in terms of like purchasing and selling or, you know, income versus donations and gifts for, you know, those kind of things. Like, would that be something where if they come after you in terms of like, well, who, who bought the liquor and all that kind of stuff, would that be a, you'd have to pressure them and say, well, what, what are you trying to enforce? Because this is a private kind of uh, operation here, but right. then also in terms of like, instead of purchasing it, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm making that, that kind of in the best way possible, but I'm just saying like, I, I've heard with PMAs, it's, in, it's, it's better to conceptualize it with donations and gifts, as opposed to, um, you know, services, products and all that kind of stuff. Cause you're using all of that public uh, jurisdiction language. Am I, am I off base there or what? No, I mean, I, I, I mean, for us, we, we use the word donation because we're a ministry. Now you could have a restaurant that takes donations. So a cheeseburger and fries is a $5 donation. I mean, it's, it's just how you want to, you, you as the trustees want to set it up. So you could put that it's $5 or it's, you know, uh, a half ounce of silver or whatever it is you're going to take for your, your payment when it comes, when it comes to that. So a lot of the stuff we do is by donation. Now, um, being that when money comes in, you know, it's tax free, but if I have, you know, say we have somebody working for Liberty house, they are not, you know, an employee, they're just a, a, a contracted employee. So at the end of the year, they would get a 1099 and then they're responsible for their end of the, uh, the taxes. But, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure like how to answer your question there. Cause a lot of it's like really specific to each individual need. And it's hard to say, Hey, this is how you do it. Cause my dog's with me at the office. One person's going to hear it and they're gonna be like, Oh, that's how it is for all PMAs. That's why I don't really talk taxes. Like go see a tax advisor, you know, ask them those things. But in general, if you're a faith-based, this is how it is. So um, I really think that, yeah, it's, it's really going to be on a case by case basis. You know, I don't think there's one way to conceptualize everything. It's more of, okay, we want to set up. And when I talk to people, it's like, okay, what are you looking to do with your PMA? Well, we want to do this. Okay, great. Do you have a mission statement? What are you trying to, what problem are you trying to solve? What service are you trying to provide? How do you want to make a difference? And give me, you know, three or four sentences of like a mission statement. Okay. And then we talk further about, well, Okay. Like the butchers, for example. Okay. Now, are you just going to be doing butchery or maybe you're going to hold classes on how to dress a deer? Like these are things we need to think about because these are all things you can do within your PMA. And again, you know, you have your trustees, it's all done on a two thirds vote. If you wanted to change the bylaws, add to the bylaws, you know, or your articles of organization, something along those lines. So yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it's a lot of, you know, really specific when I talk to somebody, okay, well, let's dive into what you're looking to do to be able right. to answer some of the questions, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, the hardest part is getting people to unwrap their minds around what they already know and say, okay, let's look at it at a different way. And this is how we're going to do it. And, you know, we're going to use things like educators instead of teachers. And we're going to use things like, 
donations as opposed to payment or that sort of thing. So, you know, some people say, oh, it's just a play on words. Yeah, it might be, but words have a lot of, of substantial holding to them, you know, when you use them properly. Yeah. And I've heard you talk, touch on this too, in a couple of your streams where, um, you know, you, you mentioned the common law, so I kind of got to dig into it as well, where, where some people are too wrapped up in this, uh, you know, I guess, patriot mythology. Um, I'm not, the, I'm not the name, I'm all that kind of stuff. And I wonder if some of the question that I just previously asked, I wonder if a lot of that is, you can take back the words if you know how to enforce those. And, you know, there's maybe there's some merit in some of whatever of that whole kind of concept. But what Dr. Graves is teaching and with Alphonse and those people, they're trying to like let you know that, you know, those the systems that are in place are in place that you can use. You just know how to use them. So I'm wondering if that previous question was more like, well, you can you can you can effectively use the words you want to use if you know how to enforce them and what they mean and how to kind of effectively use them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I have, uh, and I have friends that are in, uh, I don't know if they're big in Canada, but we have state nationalists, state citizen nationals. I think they call themselves. Anyways, they, it, it does fall into that Patriot mythology. And I looked into that, you know, years ago and I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting. My all capital letters name and my birth certificate's worth something because my mother unknowingly sold me at, you know, when, you know, my birth certificate is now bonded and I'm a vessel lost at sea and all this other stuff in it. I, hey, listen, at one in the morning, it makes for some very interesting reading, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, the more I looked into it and the more you see people talking about it, they don't really have anything to prove that this stuff works. Like if you're in Alfonso's groups or doc, Dr. Graves, you can see where they're like, Oh, here's a court. Here's a statue. Here's things that back what we're saying. And I think, you know, a lot of people come into the thing as, Oh, I'm a sovereign citizen. Okay. Well now you're a terrorist. If you're in the U S right. Like that's got a bad rap to it. We're all sovereign of our state and states are sovereign. Yes, that is true. And I think a sovereign citizen is just kind of an, um, a dumb term anyways, or an oxymoron, however you want to look at it. But exactly, if you know how to articulate how your PMA works and why you're doing things a certain way, what standings you have to rely on to be able to show that this is why something is a certain way, it definitely has a lot more weight to be held than, um, well, we're meeting and that ticket or that summons has my all capital letters name on it. And that's not me because I'm Aaron of the house of Bowman or something ridiculous like that. Right. Where, you know, and I've, and like I said, I've got friends that follow Anna Von Wrights, I think her last name is. And, you know, and I looked into it and I was like, okay, you know, and then I'm like, well, I had one guy here in Connecticut and he was like, yeah, I haven't paid taxes in 35 years. And I'm like, well, you live in a van down by the river. Of course you're not paying taxes. <laughs> you know, like it's just, yeah. you know, like if you look at the Steve Emerson files, you know, there's a lot of really good tax information there and the definition of what a taxpayer is. And, you know, I'm still diving into a lot of this stuff and understanding it. And it's like, once you realize that everything that's put in place, it works, you just need to know how to use it. And you don't need to start your own system outside of the system and, you know, your own government and all these other things that some of these state nationals want to do. And, you know, the, the Patriot mythology stuff. And it's just, it's frustrating because it's like, I have these conversations and there's, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, Brian, something or other. I've had a couple conversations on people in like the Carolinas. And I guess this guy had been recently doing like seminars and I think he worked for the government. I've watched a couple of his videos and I got about 10 minutes in and then he started talking about, you know, your all capital letters name. And I was like, yep, all done. Like, I don't care whatever else you have to say after that. Um, you know, he does talk about PMAs a little bit and I think he's, I don't know. He seems to have an idea of, of things, but it's like, it's construed with other stuff, which I want things very clean and precise and very easy to understand. And if I do this, then I have to do this. Like when you go through the how to win in court case, you know, the how to win in court class and through Dr. Graves, it's like, start here, read this. Now go to this, take this test, move on to this. And then it's like, okay, well now I have to file a 
emotion. Okay, well, how do I go? So I go back to the motions and read that one over again, just to make sure I'm doing something right. You know, and once you start seeing all the pieces fall in place, it's a lot easier to be able to defend your PMA or whatever it is that you're doing, or even just defending your, your own rights to know when you're trespassed on or when somebody's violated one of your rights. Or, you know, I, I, I've really liked how some of these guys are using the U.S. Uh, code, you know, for wire fraud and all these other things where they're trying to extort money from you through the mail and, you know, uh, you know, uh, mail fraud filings and bar grievances. And I'm like, I never knew any of this stuff. And now it's like, wow, you can really, you know, keep these people, you know, to toe the line. And uh, I think that's also needs to be done with PMA. So when I talk to people, it's not like, hey, here's your documents. Good luck. It's all right, now you need to go read this. You need to look into this. I would suggest you take this course because if you do get served with a summons or you get a complaint filed against you, you need to know either how to answer it yourself or what your attorney's talking about when it comes time to answering it. So I think that, you know, you can use donations or cost or payment or what have you. You just need to know how to articulate it enough should you be challenged. Yeah, well, I love how you touched on the uh, the mail fraud and the extortion kind of piece of that too, because you can effectively, if they can't prove how they have the authority to ask you certain questions, put stuff in the mail and demand that you potentially have to pay money because of X, Y, and Z, if you can do something as simple as look up their Dun & Bradstreet number, find out that they're a private corporation, they're doing a contract with the state or whatever, and now they're trying to contract with you, which is a private organization, but they're doing it in an intimidating way where they're trying to get money out of you. Those are all hopefully pieces that you can kind of like listen to just that description and go, I wonder if you can think about how many ways they're doing things that are illegal and violating your rights just within that. And you can play around with that. And all of that could be legal if you know how to enforce those things without right. doing the whole, you know, I'm the all caps and all that kind of stuff, right? Like these systems are there. It's just, you don't know about them. Yeah, true. You, you, you don't. And uh, it, it, it is just educating yourself. And, you know, like before, I think we started recording, we were talking about like YouTube and stuff like that. And, you know, you can listen, there's some great information out there. There's some bad information, check everything once, twice, maybe even three times. But if you put the time and energy into it, even just with Dr. Graves course, start going through that maybe watch the stuff that Alphonse has done on YouTube or on uh, some of the other podcasts he's been on. He, he breaks it down really simple. I think one of his videos is like a six simple steps or six step system or something like that, where, you know, if you, if you have people that are violating your rights, you need to know how to stand up for yourself because you know, what people don't understand is most attorneys are in it to make a buck and their first duty is to the court, you know, so it's not to you. So, you know, you need to, you know, just like if I was, you know, going to buy a car, I don't need to know how the whole car was put together, but I need to know how certain aspects of the car works, you know? So like, Hey, um, if the guy tells you, Oh, it just replaced the muffler bearings. I'm going to be like, really muffler bearings. Like those don't exist. Nice try. You know? So it's just having like, you know, a, a basic knowledge of how all these things work and then dive into the sections you need to dive into when it comes time. Yeah. And that's, there's people that I know that are traveling and Canada is crazy to get it's super easy to leave the country, but to get back into your own country, it's absolute tyranny right now. But it's just exactly what you're saying there too. think of them as a person trying to upsell you on your car or something like that. And they're saying, Oh, you have to quarantine for, for this amount of time. And they just told you that you need muffler bearings. And you're like, really? And then yeah. it could be just something as simple as is that is that mandatory? Or is that voluntary? What's your source of authority? And if they can't describe it to you, you're like, so what, what are you telling me right now? Am I breaking the law or am I not breaking the law? What law are you referring to? And if they, they don't, don't know even know. <laughs> exactly, right? And you're yep. only really bound by, like to a certain degree, like you're bound by laws that are in your country. If they're not a law, you don't have to, you, there's there, actually, there's kind of a moral duty not to abide by them just on sheer principle. Right. Um, but again, it's those things you kind of need to know, right? And I just... Yeah, I, I did maybe wanted to kind of clarify that between the idea of having to change every single conceptualization of your name, because, you know, now people don't want to say the word understand, because understand means you're standing under the authority. But it's like, dude, if you're talking to people, if we're just having a conversation right now, you can say the word understand, you know what I mean? It's those kind of things that. Yeah, I think and I think some people get so wrapped up in it, they can't see the forest of the trees, you know, I, you know, I try to, you know, my dad always said, you know, you know, use the KISS acronym, keep it simple, stupid, you know, Sim you know, yeah. it, it, as long as you do that, or, you know, um, I, and not get too wrapped up into where, like, I can't say, understand, like, listen, it, yeah, I don't, I mean, personally, me, if I have to say, yeah, I understand what you're talking about, I'm going to say that, like, the, 
what it comes to at the end of the day is if you are in court or something like that, you need to know how to plead your case and you need to know how to move the court. It's as simple as that, you know, and that's what that Dr. Graves course is going to teach you. It's going to teach you how to use what's put in place by our founding, our founding fathers and how to keep people online with what they should be doing. And that's what I love about the the PMAs. You know, all this stuff has been put there in place for us, just never knew how to use it. Now that we're all starting to learn how to use it, it's kind of like that silent protest and that big middle finger to like, hey, guess what? I'm doing what I want to do as a free person of this country. And uh, there's nothing you can do about it unless, you know, I decided to do something inherently evil, you know? So, uh, I, uh, yeah, I think people just really need to educate themselves and really kind of, you know, look into the PMAs more as a part of everything else, you know? So if you, you know, lost your job, like I said before earlier, as a medical professional or as a teacher, well, guess what? You have the opportunity to start a PA or PHA and start providing an income for your family again, which is, you know, something you, you are allowed to do while providing a service to the community and building a network. So, yeah, I think just, Unfortunately, we're just really dumb. We need some education, you know. It's yep. that's that's what it is. You know, we're more concerned about Netflix and YooHoo and the Kardashians and who's done what and you know, Bachelor number fifteen on you know whatever show. It's it's insane, you know. Yeah. If half the people spent even a quarter of the time looking and researching how our you know here anyways in the U.S. how it was set up and meant to be run and be used and what the government is actually put in place for is to protect your inalienable rights. If somebody should invade, not sit there and wait for a handout from the government, then things would be a lot different, you know, but they want us fat, dumb, and stupid. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's the issue with those kind of that information that we were just talking about. There is people, some people, when they, as soon as they break free from the Netflix kind of matrix, they're like, okay, well, what do I need to know? And then there's all this information that's kind of down this, it's just, it's you know trying to make you rethink about everything and it's like no it's just trying to basically get the understanding of what you need to know without all this extra i just i think it's to a degree it's like you know you kind of have to be aware of it but at the same time i think it's it's just a necessary it's it's an unnecessary diversion down a rabbit hole that you're kind of like man it's just it's not exactly I think there's, I think there's, a, it's just something that like people are looking for a solution and they're trying to latch onto anything and they're going like, okay, well, this seems like a lot of people are talking about it and a lot of people know about it. It must be true, but it's still got that tinge of it's, it's just not, it's not the, the route you need to go down. It's more about like actually le learning about your rights, how to enforce them, what the court system does, how to use the court and all those kind of things. Right. It's yeah. Yeah. And it's very like, you, you know, and, and you're right. It's like a whole lot of information at once. I want to learn everything at once. Like some of these people have been studying this stuff for years, decades, you know, and it's, you know, whether it's the law or the constitution. So, you know, start with, you know, Chris Ann Hall stuff on the basic Liberty stuff. It's good information, you know, it's money well spent and there's, you know, workbooks you can go through to really get an understanding and then, okay, so now I've got that down. I've got the constitution or the, um, your uh, rights and freedoms, uh, their charter of rights and freedoms. I have to look at it because I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. But, uh, you know, start with that. Start understanding those documents. And then here in the States, understanding your state constitution and what it allows or, or affords. And then, okay, now you've got those basics down. Now start learning how the court systems work if that interests you. Or maybe it's just you want to learn about taxation and why am I paying so much in taxes? You know, uh, okay, well, how, what is a taxpayer? Start looking up those things. You don't have to learn it all learn what fits what you need to learn for right now. You know, it's, it's just all about taking small little bites. Like how, what do they say? Like, how do you, you know, a horse by one bite at a time or something like that? You know, it's that, that same concept to take little bits and pieces and just digest it. And then when you got a good understanding, move on to the next and then just ask questions in some of these telegram groups, you know, like, I mean, we probably don't need another telegram group. I mean, I'm in so many right now. I can't keep up, but, yeah. um, you know, it's just really getting the basics down and, and just starting to understand how this all works together. Same thing with a PMA, just because, you know, you, you know, I'm on your podcast here and somebody sees this doesn't mean you need to go running out and get a PMA, you know, give me a call or shoot me an email. We'll have a conversation about PMAs and where you need to look at and where to start. And again, it starts right at the basic level It's just understanding your constitutional rights, you know? you right, the freedom, right, the, you know, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom to petition the government, you know, or, you know, all those things. And just understanding that is you're already leaps and bounds ahead of most people, you know, so 
Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great point with with everything happening in the world right now is if you even do the most moderate amount of effort and work into learning these things, you're already leaps and bounds ahead of other people who are just, you know, because I think another another important thing that I think to, to, re, to remember right now, too, is it's not there was a great thing that I heard recently that was like no complaining without solutions. And it's not enough to be opposed to what's going on. You have to build what you want to build, right? Because then you're still just giving the effort and your energy to what you don't want, as opposed to anything that you do want. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it, it's, I think there's too many people that are going to all of these rallies or doing something like that. And then they're eating the same stuff and they're still looking at the same things. And it's like, if they want you fat, dumb, and stupid, it's like the way to get around that is to be as healthy, intelligent, you know what I mean? And it's like, yep. I think there's too much energy on fighting and fighting and fighting and nothing on, you know, building. Yeah. And you know, we, we, I've been to a few rallies here in Connecticut, the state Capitol. I spoke at one once and it's, um, you know, the rallies are all great, but they're rallies. They're there to get you that hoorah, rah, let's get behind this. Let's do this, but they're not protests. And we need to really bring back protesting and peaceful old school protesting. I mean, if you look at how they protested during the whole conception of founding this country, you know, they had mock people hanging from nooses. They had mock coffins with people's names written on the side. Like they really shamed the people in power for what they were doing. And we're not doing that now. Like, you know, it's great to go protest in front of the, you know, or to rally in front of the pro, you know, the governor's mansion in Connecticut or wherever you're at or the state capitals, but you really need to go out there and shame these people for what they're doing. You know, we've elected them to do one thing. They're not listening to us. They're doing what, you know, what they want with whoever's putting the most money in their pocket. I mean, like, you know, it was like, you know, uh, about a, maybe a week ago, they were handing out home testing, right? Rapid testing for the, the big C. And uh, it was amazing the amount of people that were standing in line. And I'm like, you're waiting in line to get a test, to go home to see if you're ill. Like, you, I'm like, well, get used to it. That's like communist Russia right there. You're waiting in line to get something handed out by the government. Next, it'll be milk and bread. But, you know, they don't even think that, that is, there's anything wrong with that. They're like, okay, this is what I need to do. And I'm like, seriously, like stand on your own two feet. And, you know, I think that if people were more in tune to holding the people that they've elected, like, for example, um, what we were just talking about with the, the testing kits, our governor's wife has her hand in like the company that makes it or something along those lines. Oh, and yeah. they actually have um, warehouse storage receipts. I think it was the, there's a couple of people here in Connecticut that were looking into the things that were going on. And she actually had a whole bunch of this stuff stored before it even hit, you know? So like, there's just things that don't add up. And it's like, listen, if we start holding these people that we've elected to actual like shaming them and what they're doing and not listening to us, things are going to start changing and actually voting these people out of office, which I hope our voting system still stays intact with everything that happened over the last couple of years, because, you know, they're still trying to reform stuff where I have to show my license to go, you know, cash a check or go buy a six pack of beer, but I can just walk in and vote for whoever I want as many times as I want without showing ID. I hope some of those things don't go through. Because if that's the case, then we'll never have another fair election as long as we live here. But um, I think, you know, we need to stop doing the rallies. You know, the rallies are great. Let's start getting back to old school protests and really shame these politicians that have been elected, that have just done what they've wanted and run a muck of things, you know. But I'll get off my soapbox on that one now. <laughs> no, no, I, I know it's great. Like, I think I think it's exactly that. And that's that's why I was really intrigued by PMAs when I first heard about them and why, you know, I'm really thankful for your time here, because I think these are things uh, that are sort of of the past, but what we need to bring into the future, too. Right. I think that's with everything, with even food and, and how we're nourishing ourselves and all this kind of things, because you know, I don't think this is going to go away very easily. And these are, well, imagine everybody that went to that rally was a part of some sort of PMA that they were just spending money within the communities of which they're inhabiting. And it's like, you have no idea what the power would be behind that, as opposed to spending all your effort and energy into this, you know, BS. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what's, what's great about building this network of PMAs and, you know, really establishing, you know, I'm trying to get them established here in Connecticut and I will help anybody wherever they're at. You know, I've had people because we, you know, just named the telegram group East coast PMAs and that's, 
you know, they're like, well, do I have to be on the East coast to get a PMA for me? I'm like, no, I can, I can set them up anywhere. You know, we just have to have a conversation about it. And I, you know, what's great about it is, is as we start to set these up and more people start getting on board with the Liberty Dollar Financial Association. Um, I've talked to Wayne over there a bunch of times. I've really put their, and they're not hundred percent live yet. And I've really put their system through the ringer as far as trying different things with it, because it answered a lot of, it checked off a lot of boxes for us when it came to banking, you know, and uh, the fact that it's backed by silver and I can send it electronically, so to speak, just like Venmo or cash app or something like that, which now are going to be tracked by the IRS and you're going to be taxed on if you spend so much through there, like, okay, enough's enough. Like we need an alternate way of doing this. And this is going to be a great way of doing it. And it's completely legal within the PMA system because, and even local businesses that they wanted to accept it because yes, it's not legal tender, but if I said, Hey Rob, I'm going to, you know, buy that car from you and I'm going to give you a hundred ounces of silver. Well, you know, that works out to being like, let's say $2,000. And you're like, yeah, I'll sell you this, this beater of a car for two grand. Great. Well, here's a hundred ounces of silver. And now you and I have had our transaction and now I'm on my way with my new car. It, you know, we can do that within the PMAs. And the fact that Wayne and Bernard had set this up to where, you know, they're able to do it electronically, you know, peer to peer lending, a whole bunch of different things within the system. I think that's just one more key element of really just keeping the private private and not having to deal with the nonsense that that's going on. So like, if it gets to the point where, yeah, you can't go to the grocery store. Okay. No worry about it. I'm going to pay this PMA, you know, 20 ounces of silver and they're going to send me the meat, dairy, and, you know, flour. I need to make my own bread or what have you. And that's, that's kind of where I would like to see things get to the point where, you know, and even talking with David, you know, when I first started his whole thing too, was, you know, the more of these we get set up, the better off we'll be, the more we can contract privately between PMA and PMA and not have to worry about everything falling down around us because these PMAs are going to become a huge community and be able to support each other, you know, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. I love that. I've heard you talk about that before. I was going to get into that um, as well, but yeah, I, with that though, so you're using that just in terms of, I guess, building that different system. But I guess some of my other questions here was, what about things like using the public platforms and public, I guess, um, public institutions or public sort of, I guess, things that are already in the public, using that for your PMA, if you want to do things like advertisements or anything like that, like, are there things that would bring you back into that public jurisdiction operating as a private organization that you might need to look out for, or are those things sort of, um, you can advertise all you want, but you can't know anything about like the actual goings on unless you're a member. Right. So it would be like, if you wanted to advertise, like, let's say we had like our, our holiday bazaar and we, we put that out there to some freedom groups. And we, I think some people put it out on Facebook, which is public, right. Which that's completely fine. Cause we're also looking at increasing our membership. So the only way to do that is by having these semi public events, right? You still have to be a member for the day to come in and we can still advertise about it, but I'm not putting out on Facebook what our last minutes of our meeting were, how many members we have, you know, what the age groups are, stuff like that. That all stays private, but we do like we had a fall festival and that's kind of where the whole podcast thing came from. Cause one of the guys there actually had me on his and I was like, well, maybe I should start doing this, you know, instead of just real estate podcast, I'll do the PMA stuff. And that was open to the public. So we had people that were parking cars. We had, you know, Anna and myself, I was pouring beer while helping her do membership agreements for the day. And literally for us that day, we had one membership agreement highlighting the important sections. And then we had everybody fill out kind of like on a petition form, like their name, their address, their phone number. And then that way there, we were protected for that, that one day. And they paid the, the $10 non-membership fee. You know, we even had a food truck come in because uh, we were looking for a food truck and the guy's like, oh, I have to pull permits. I said, don't worry about that. We're a private membership association. It's completely private. We're not open to the public. We're expecting as many people to come through. And he was like, dude, you have no idea how much time and energy you saved me because he was coming probably a good hour, hour and a half drive across the state. And he loved it. He thought it was the greatest thing. I mean, we had four bands that showed up, freedom bands that played music throughout the day. And it was just a really nice event. Plus we had all the vendors there, you know, that sold local arts and crafts and, and so, and so on and so forth. And, you know, yeah. Was it open to the public? Technically no, but could people that weren't part of the PMA or the, the ministry come? Yes, because we were trying to bring in new members and let other 
groups out there know that another homeschool is like, Hey, here's another resource for you. Here's what we're looking to do. Here's some of our concepts for down the road and, you know, come out and meet us and ask questions. And it was a great event. You know, we, it was, it was a lot of fun, but again, it was one of those things where it's not a hundred percent private and it's not a hundred percent public either. You know, it's kind of like in that, that gray area, but it, that's where that gray area comes in for like membership you know, bringing people into the, into the, the ministry or PMA, if you have one, depending on what you're doing with it. Yeah. But, I actually hadn't, I hadn't heard that you, that you can do a, you know, your either yearly membership or a daily one. That's interesting yep. too. I, yeah. And yeah. it's the same exact membership that they signed for the yearly. We just wrote daily across the top of it. And that's the benefit of having a PMA is the trustees got together and said, Hey, listen, we want to do this. How do we protect ourselves? I was like, we should just have a one day membership and let's just write, one day across the top, the date and how much they paid. And then if they ever choose to become an annual member, then we'll just cross that out initial it and say one year, you know, annual membership and we'll put our seal on it and that's it. It gets filed with the rest of them. And it worked out well. People were like, okay, this is kind of cool. I understand this now more. And they ask a bunch of questions and they see, you know, everybody, you know, fellowshipping and sell, you know, not really celebrating, but just, you know, fellowshipping around and, and talking and having a good time. And, you know, uh, knock on wood, we haven't had really any issues yet. It's been, it's been pretty, pretty great so far. So are there anything in terms of, um, you were mentioning one gentleman had the exact same name and he was running the LLC through the PM, whatever that might've been. Is there anything outside of that, that people might need to conceptualize that might bring you back into the public jurisdiction to kind of watch out for, or is it more again, case by case basis, those kind of things? No, I mean, it's really just keeping things separate. So if you are going to have the sole proprietorship, the LLC, S Corp, whatever it is you're doing, you know, cause you've already have like an established business that you want to turn into a PMA, keep everything separate, have a real defining line where, you know, um, this side is the PMA, this side is the, uh, the, the public business. And as long as you're not blurring those two, like, oh, I'm going to take in money from the LLC, but then I'm going to use that money to buy something for the PMA. I would have, you know, the P the LLC or the public entity donate the money to the PMA. I, you know, that way there, they can see it coming in as a donation. They're getting a receipt for it. You're still keeping things separate. The problem you run into is when you have people coming in, putting a bunch of stuff out on social media, really kind of, you know, giving up the house as far as what you're doing, where you're meeting, what you, you know, you're meeting about now, again, like if you're doing a recruitment or I hate using the word recruitment, but if you want to bring in new members, then some of that stuff has to be put out there. But again, that comes from the trustees and the trustees say, okay, we're doing an event. Here's the flyer that we've made. This can go out here, here, and here. As long as you're operating in the private and you keep things private, you're going to be good. When you start kind of blending those lines and, oh, well, we're going to say the PMA was doing this, but really the LLC paid for it. And then that's where things kind of get, you know, kind of get muddy in the water, so to speak. And I think on the most part, when people set these up and they really see that, okay, there's a defined line on what I can and can't do as far as, okay, well, this is like, you know, I, uh, Ernie Hancock interviewed me and he was like, well, how many members do you have? I'm like, well, I'm not telling you, like, I'm just not telling you that. Like, it's not happening. You know, that's private to the, to the association or to the, uh, the ministry. So things like that. But I can say, yeah, we have a handful of families, you know, I don't have to give you a uh, precise number, but it's really understanding once you kind of read your founding documents and you understand what's in them and how they're written and, voting rights and who can be a member who can't be a member so you know like quick example anybody over the age of 18 can be a member if it's a family and it's you know parents with two minor kids well the kids are automatically part of the pma based on the family you know if somebody isn't doing something correctly or is causing harm to another member or is not acting in the way that the majority of the members see fit, like maybe the person keeps putting something out on social media about the PMA on a two thirds vote, they can remove that person from the PMA mm-hmm. and they don't ever have to let them back in. So there's things written in there that allows the, the, the trustees to really run everything the way it needs to be done. So that's one of the things that I run into a lot is, well, do I really need three trustees? No, you don't. I prefer to have it. You could do two trustees and one at large, but when I set these up, I want to make sure that if they are ever challenged, when you go to court to show your documents, say, Hey, we're, we're acting properly as a private membership association. 
here's our, you know, whether you meet annually, biannually, monthly, and you have member meetings, well, here's the minutes of the meetings. Here's our bylaws. Here's our articles of organization. Here's our membership agreement. Here's where the, the trustees has voted on such and such things. Here's maybe the advisory board that advised on this. So it's not like a single member LLC where it's passed through income and it's one person calling the shots. You know, it's, you know, two or three people that have this trustees that are, are running everything. So you could do two trustees, a trustee at large, you know, something like that, or just leave the seat open. But, you know, normally when I set these up, I prefer, you know, three trustees and, you know, it could be, uh, you know, spouses, it could be cousins, it could be, you know, like the guy I'm, I'm helping out with the gym, it's, you know, him, I think it's his sister, and then one of the employees there that does a lot of work there. So, you know, it's, it's just having that system in place. So when you are challenged, you can say, no, I'm app, I'm operating the way I should be. And there's mm -hmm. no, there's no, you know, monkey business going on behind the scenes. You know, now if you're embezzling money or doing something inherently wrong, well then again, that's on you. You've made those decisions. Now you have to live with it. But, right. So, so yeah. you, you can have family members and stuff like that, be your trustees. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. As long as they're over the age of 18 and they're a sound mind. Yeah. Um, have you had any pushback or anything like that from the state uh, where you're at or anything? Have you had any run-ins and any nothing, sort of way? nothing right. yet? And and we've had some larger events and nobody's nobody said boo to us. The only time we've had anything is when uh, where we were having some of our events. We were looking at the spot that was one of our trustees he had, and we were thinking of you know renting it from him to use part of the spot because his brewery wasn't up and running yet, and his uh his tap room. So we're like, Oh, we can use part of it, help you kind of cover the rent and that sort of thing. We had some events there. There was a mixed martial arts gym right next door and they never wore masks or I don't, I think very rarely wore masks during the whole, whole uh, situation. And one of the students there, I think was, if I remember correctly, was like the wife of the husband who was trying to run for the position of zoning and get the other guy out or something like that so she went home and was like hey somehow our flyer ended up on the zoning board's desk that's all i know i have no no know exactly how it got there but it was more like well who the heck are these people and you know how are they meeting there and that's when it was brought to the landlord and that wasn't even brought to us and we're like okay you know what we don't you know we're not even enough sure if we're renting this spot yet we don't want to cause you any more harm we don't want to infringe on your rights as the building owner so that's when we started looking for other places to go to. But, you know, again, that probably could have been, you know, uh, handled differently. You know, if I had just gone, you know, the trustees and I had just gone to the town and said, Hey, listen, we're going to be utilizing the spot, you know, we're going to be meeting once a month or what have you. And, and that's it. But, you know, then and it's funny too, because when I, when I first started all this, I, I called a couple different towns and I, you know, I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm thinking of starting a private membership association. You know, what do I have to, you know, does there anything I have to file with the town or anything? And they're like a private, what I'm like a private membership association. They're like, Oh, well, you got to have zoning come out and the fire marshal. And I'm like, yeah, you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. So you know what? we're just not going to call you again. And uh, that's kind of, you know, how we went on with our business. And we recently found a spot that we're going to be using um, that is uh, is a great building. And uh, it, not only is it going to help us out, but it's also going to help out this older community that was flourishing years ago, but a lot of people had left. A lot of the farmland was turned into these monstrosity of houses. So I think they have an older, I mean, older membership, like in the sixties and seventies, but there's only like 15 people and they haven't rented this place out in a while. So we're actually going to start renting it from them to use it throughout the, the week. So it's, uh, it's cool. We, we, you know, they liked what we were doing and we can help them out and pay the help and pay the taxes on the place and stuff like that. And, and cover some of the costs while giving a, a roof over our heads until we have raised enough money to buy a piece of land and put up our own building, you know, which eventually is where we want to get. Yeah, that's great too. And like you were saying, uh, from the beginning was, um, you know, finding people who are like-minded in terms of if you need spaces and renting and stuff like that, it's, it's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was going to dive into maybe some more specific things in terms of like, how do you pay yourself for your employees and stuff like that? But maybe that's more like you were saying before about it, it's kind of, it's a very situational and things that people need to do one-on-one -on -one if you're a big gym, if you're a plumber, whatever it might be. Um, so I'm just wondering to maybe wrap things up, like what, uh, how do people get a hold of you? How do people, if they're interested, um, contact you and all that kind of stuff? And what sort of things do you need from them if, they, uh, if they're interested in this? 
Yeah. So um, I'm pretty easy to find online because I am a realtor. So all my stuff's all over the place, but you can reach me at East Coast PMA at protonmail.com. Uh, you can shoot me an email there. You can feel free to shoot me a text at 860-849-9227. And pretty much all we'd have to do is, you know, have a conversation 30 minutes to maybe an hour, depending on how in-depth we get kind of understanding what you're looking to do with your PMA, why you want to set one up, who your trustees are going to be, your mission statement. And then um, it takes me uh, a little over a week sometimes, depending on how busy I am with uh, my full-time life and, and this uh, to get them written up. And then um, I help you, you know, get everything established and EIN if you need it. And then of course I'll recommend some of the courses that we've talked to on here. Cause I think they're important piece of it. And then, uh, that's pretty much it. You're off to the races, you know? So it, um, the biggest part is the initial conversation and just taking some notes and, and getting some information from the people that are looking to have them set up, but that's really the easiest way. Um, we do have a Facebook group, uh, East coast PMA and a telegram group. Um, so you can feel free to jump on there and ask questions. I try to get on the telegram group weekly to do some type of live chat or Q and a, and we've had some great questions on there and stuff like that. Um, but to answer your question really fast on the, the pay, and then I'll keep it kind of a brief on this is um, one, I haven't paid myself yet at all. So uh, <laughs> that hasn't happened, but when it would, or if we hired somebody, yes, the money coming into our ministry is tax exempt. But at the end of the day, when we pay anybody out for working for us or any of the trustees, they would get a 1099 at the end of the year. And then you would handle the taxes um, on that side as the person receiving the 1099. So as like a real estate agent, you know, um, it's not a W2 job for me. It's a 1099 because I'm a contracted employee. So I have to make sure I set aside taxes and stuff like that. But then if you start going down the Steve Emerson rabbit hole and you learn that maybe you shouldn't be paying taxes because you're not technically a taxpayer based on the definition, well, then, you know, you have that whole wormhole to, to go into and figure it out. But yeah, in, in a nutshell, in the, in the 10,000 foot view, that's pretty much how it would be done. You know, the money would come into the PMA and then either the trustees or any paid positions would get a 1099 at the end of the year. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm sure that there's a lot more questions that people might have. These were the, the sort of main ones that I had. I, I've spoken to a couple of different guys been trained by uh, David uh, himself too. So um, I kind of knew some of these things, but I think it's very um, important, this information for people to understand. And uh I can't thank you enough for your time and also diving into this yourself, because I think, you know, these things are relatively new in, in the zeitgeist of what, what's happening out there. Um, but they're, they're kind of, they're, they're tried, they're tested, they're ironclad if you know how to kind of use them. And um, I was just wondering, you know, I'd like to try to end these in some of the, some of a more empowering note. And I think the entire conversation itself here is uh, basically taking full sort of like uh, you know, reliability and responsibility on yourself and you uh, empowering in its own right. But I was wondering, I've kind of realized, like I was saying about no complaining without solutions, trying to figure out what you want to build as opposed to just complaining about the way things are. And I think that a lot of this PMA stuff and the laws things, you know, it's like, I think we need to get as radically self-reliant as possible in all aspects of your life. And unfortunately, that might mean more like quote unquote, boring things like the law or your rights or whatever. Right. But you yeah. know, this is the, this is the, this is the world that we're in right now. And we might have to do some harder shit than we've done before. And that's life. So I was wondering if you have any, any empowerment solutions that people might be able to take a hold of and find courage, bravery, and stand, stand tall at this time, what, what would your advice be? Yeah. So my advice would be to turn that television off, start with some non-compliance and then really dive into whether you're in Canada or in the U S what your founding documents have to say, what your, your, um, your constitutional rights are and really wrap your head around that. So, you know, when you're being violated and then know how to handle those people that are violating your, your, your rights. And it really, you know, it really starts with just unplugging and, and getting away from all the fear mongering that's going on on the television and the daily so-called death tolls and everything like that. And really just saying, you know what, enough's enough. I'm done. I'm going to start living my life the way we were meant to live. And, you know, if you're a religious person then keep going that route with that, but understanding that we have an inalienable rights, we need to know how to defend them and 
they're not going to teach us. We're going to have to teach ourselves because they don't want us to know. Because once we have that knowledge, like they say, knowledge is power. Wow, I just sounded like an afternoon uh, special. That was terrible. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's true. It is true. You know, it's just unplugging and understanding what you need to do in order to protect yourself and your rights and how to provide for your family in the private should you need be if you lose your job because you don't want to wear a mask or get tested weekly or take a jab. You know, there are, there are alternatives to not only fighting them in court, but still being able to provide for your family. Yes, there are solutions and people such as yourself are, are putting them out there, putting those solutions out there. And I can't thank you enough for what you're doing for your time. And uh, I'll link everything in the show notes. If you're cool with all your information, I'll throw that into the description as well. Uh, yeah, I'll link to your YouTube channel. You've got some great conversations there. Uh, I urge everyone to go there. Uh, if you like the conversation, like, subscribe, comment uh, to both of our channels, all, the, all that fun stuff. And um, maybe I'll give you a last word, Aaron. Oh, I'm good. I appreciate the opportunity. I know we tried to do this a couple of times. It's been hectic this week and uh, it, it never seems like it's a good time, but you know, at least we got it, we made it work today, Yeah, which is awesome. Right. Yeah, no. I, and I can't thank you enough for your time. All that stuff is just sort of, uh, you know, th things you got to put up with to get this good information out there. So I'm just thankful for your time. Uh, everyone else, I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you did. Um, hopefully we can get you on here again if people will resonate with this and have more interesting questions uh, or, or things that, that they kind of bring up or things that we didn't kind of touch on here. Uh, I grew up into that. But um, yeah, everyone else, we'll catch you on the next one and I uh, hope you enjoy. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it.